talking about it. Um, this is the 15th annual Experimental Gameplay Workshop. That's 15 years of experimental games. That's amazing. How many of you have been to Experimental Gameplay before? Yeah, welcome back. All right, now, how many of you are here for the very first time? <gasps> oh, we loved it. We, we're so happy you chose us and that you waited in the long line. That was, that was long. Thank you for getting into the session, for sitting so nice and peacefully and just gathering here together. Um, it's, I'm not going to lie, it's been, a, it's been a little bit of a tough year so far. Um, for a lot of us. Um, we, we lost some people that we really love. Um, we've seen a little bit too much of some people. And, uh, and when we were trying to think of what to say, you know, to welcome you into the session, uh, I realized that what I wanted to say is that this is the best session of GDC. <laughs> because it's about the community. Uh, we could not have organized this year without the help of some amazing, amazing people. So before we get started, I want Eddie and Ted to come up here and stand up on stage. These two gentlemen did an amazing job organizing all the speakers, getting everything ready this year because we were very busy. Um, and I also just wanted to say that the community is really in this room. The people that love experimental games are at the forefront of pushing games to where they're going to be and asking the hard questions about what they should be and dreaming the dreams of what they could be. And it's not always easy. Sometimes you work on something for four or five years and it just never hangs together and you have to set it aside. Sometimes those things come back later and they're great and sometimes they become a painful but valuable memory. And uh, this year's show is an example, like every year, of how pushing through the hard stuff is better than giving up. And so I want you to give everyone in this room a round of applause for sticking with it and staying game developers. We have a fantastic lineup. Uh, Daniel, do you want to give a little bit of a flavor of what we're, we're going to see? You want to say anything about the show? Well, we have a really a bunch of really good surprises this year, I think. Uh, and also, I wanted to say that since there's so many veterans of EGW in this room, so many people that have been coming to this session for years, uh, for next year, I want to uh, start taking suggestions. If you some games are never submitted to the EGW like it happened this year, uh, for example, Recursed. Yes. Um, and other games just fly under a radar. So if you find a game that you think is a good fit for this session, just send it to me or Robin yes. in whatever way you find most comfortable, but just get it to us so we can consider it for next year. Yes, we really like to expand the reach of experimental gameplay and to have lots of people from all over the world, all walks of life, all kinds of ways of being, to be up here on stage. And the easiest way for us to do that is to delegate that task to everybody else. And so once again, we will tell you all that it is your responsibility to let us know about the coolest shit out there because we want those people here, want them representing and speaking and bearing witness to their true, lived, awesome selves. All right, with that, we're going to end the welcome, and we're going to bring up Bennett and AP to show us multi-bowl. Hi, I'm Bennett Foddy. And I'm AP Thompson. And we're here to show you multi-bowl, which is the world's first video game collage. Multi-Bowl is a mixtape of real multiplayer games from the 1980s and 90s. Uh, and there have been projects in the past, like ROM Check Fail, or the Indie Pirate Cart, or WarioWare, that make a pastiche of multiple original games. But there's never been a collage made up of hundreds of existing games running on multiple hardware platforms. At its core, Multi-Bowl is a modified emulator. MAME, or the Multiple Arcade Machine Emulator, is the biggest and one of the oldest emulators on the planet now 20 years old, and now emulates practically every arcade game and every console and computer platform from history. 
And last year it switched to a proper open source license, so it became possible to think about projects that don't run on one hardware platform, but on all hardware platforms. Not one game, but all games. Here's how it works. It loads a random exciting moment from an old two player game and lets you compete until someone scores a goal or kills the other player or until a timer runs out. By watching the memory in the emulated computer, it detects when someone wins the point and loads another random moment from a random game. Multiball now contains over 300 games across arcade platforms, consoles, uh, and computers. And of course, there's way more than 300 good multiplayer games out there, but we tried to create a diverse list uh, in terms of gameplay, art style, and country of origin. Uh, each state is designed to run uh, for about 30 seconds before it produces a win. So some games are just naturally perfect for that format. Uh, Outlaw is uh, symmetrical and short, so we simply monitor the score and see who gets the first point. But some games need to be saved at a particular moment. For instance, after beating the final boss in Double Dragon, if both players are still alive, they then have to fight to decide who gets to rescue the red guy's girlfriend. In some cases, we change the rules to make a moment more exciting, as in this case, where the player's guns are disabled to m turn uh, Dodonpachi into a pure game of dodging. <laughs> when you start playing multiball, it's a pure test of video game talent. Who can figure out the mechanics and form strategies the fastest? Because it has a lot of uh, lesser known games, uh, nobody has played the majority of them before. But once you've been playing for a while, it uh, becomes more like a test of pure video game knowledge. Now, not every game lends itself well to competitive play, especially in 30 second slices. In Life Force, if you make the players compete for points, it's very hard to see whose bullets are hitting the enemies. And if you play to survive, it's just way too easy. Fundamentally, the problem is that each player can't affect the other player's performance. The solution we found to that is to have compound rules like score more points but don't die. So here a player can decide to be more aggressive, uh, flying closer to the enemies, uh, but that carries a risk of colliding with them. Sometimes the game itself has rules that can be harnessed to make an interesting 30 second challenge. In Timber, the point for cutting down a tree goes to the person who hits it last, kind of like in League of Legends. So we picked a state with just one tree, so there could be a standoff as players try to avoid doing the second last hit. And sometimes you need to invent entirely new rules, like in Rampage, where we challenge players to avoid touching the ground. Of course, we can't make multiball uh, available publicly for uh, legal... All right, let's do a demo now. <laughs> Uh, can we get Rich and Robin up to, to play down, down in front? Can we switch the video feed, please? <laughs> oh, God. There we oh, go. Over there. We got it. Multiba! Kashino Monogatari. Wagamichi Kiamen to sing o t o k o Player one, Rich is player two.
Red Warrior is now in. <laughs> Tag him. Tag blue. Oh, you were it the whole time. What? I didn't come on. Who cares? <laughs> <laughs> You're Richard. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> pure talent. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Rich is going to 
gonna get this by default. Thank you. Thank you. That was totally amazing, uh, even though I lost. <laughs> it's just because I pretended I couldn't play Tetris. <laughs> Under pressure. Um, all right, so uh, next up, we have, uh, we have someone coming up to show a game. But before we have them come to show a game, I would like to ask for eight volunteers who would like to play a dance game to come up and stand where the man is waving his hands. Over there. Eight, eight people only. How many have we got? One, two, three, four, five, six. I think seven, eight. I think that last person, you're done. Good. All right, we're good. Thank you. OK, so next up, uh, we have uh, Ian Thompson showing us for Cursed. Hi. Whoa. Uh, my name is Ian Thompson. I'm an independent developer from Scotland, and uh, this is Recursed. Uh, Recursed is a puzzle platform game, and by puzzle I mean logic puzzle. Uh, there's three types of items, keys that open doors, uh, blocks you can stand on to reach high places, and treasure chests which manipulate reality. Okay, I'll jump in and show some levels. I'm actually looking at it down here, so excuse me if I mess this up. Okay, so here's a simple level. We need to jump up and get that crystal. We can't jump high enough, so we need to unlock the door and get the block. First thing we find out is that when we're holding the key or any item, we don't jump as high. Okay? And the second thing we find out is that you can throw items horizontally, like this allows us to get the block and finish the level. So there's restrictions on movement and throwing and jumping that allow the levels to be there we go, sort of imbued with logic problems. Anyway, that's all just sort of puzzle platform stuff. I'm sure you're familiar with that. Um, so those treasure chests. Uh, here's a treasure chest. If I jump into this, I go to a new room. Now this room has a key and two doors. So it seems impossible. It's not impossible, because there's a subtlety to the chests that I haven't mentioned, which is when you exit them, oops, and re-enter, the room resets back to the default state, which means the door is back and the key is back. Okay, how does that help? Well, we can take this key, Leave the room, re-enter the room, and it's reset. So we have the key and the key from the previous instance. And we can open two doors with one key. So items can be duplicated. And remember, rooms are items. Uh, OK. So it seems like a positive, but there are downsides too. In this level, we have some blocks. A whole stack of them. Uh, and in the other chest, there's a crystal. There we go. So if we try and do it with one block, we see we can't get it. We need two blocks. So now I can exit, go get another block and come back. But what I find when I jump back in, my block's gone. So I'm limited to only bringing one item into the room, but we need two blocks. OK, well, it is a puzzle game. What one item do we bring? Well, we bring this room into here, like that. Then jump in here. Here's our infinite stack of blocks. Now, this room doesn't reset because I never exited it. I just went into a room beneath it. OK. There we go. So far, so simple. Don't worry, it gets so much worse. Right. So that's how chests can restructure the world in a basic sense. Let's look at this level. OK, here we have a choice of a key or a block. We can't jump high enough to get back up. Uh, let's get the key. 
We can open the door and we find out we need the block to jump up. So let's jump in the chest and see where we end up. Oh, it's back in the same room. But it's a different instance of the same room. So if I exit, here's the instance I was in before with the unlocked door. And this is a new instance. But because it's the same room, it has another chest. Which of course leads to another instance of the same room. As far as you want. You can recurse as much as you like. And you can do that and you find out that that's actually not the solution. So, I'll leave that as an exercise. Okay. Right. In the next zone, there's a water mechanic. I'm not going to show it, but when you jump into a chest that's underwater, the rooms underneath, the room you enter is flooded. So it's like stateful and that makes things a bit more confusing, but we don't want a bit more confusing, we want a lot more confusing. Which is this mechanic that's introduced in the fourth area. Um, is that the right level? Yes, there we go. In this area, we have enchanted items. Uh, this block and this key are enchanted, as you can see from the green stuff. I'll probably call them green items. Um, enchanted items are not affected by the reset mechanic. They are unique. And, um, I can't get, I can't jump that up there because I don't, can't jump high enough. So if I leave them there on the left hand side and I exit and re-enter, they're still there. They're not unique to the room instance, they're unique to the room type. It's a subtle difference. Okay, so how do we get these items up here? Well, let's look in this chest and see what we have. Nothing. It's an empty room. But rooms are items, so an empty room is like an empty backpack. So let's... Whoops. There we go, let's dump this in here, and let's dump the key in there. Okie dokie. So now we have our enchanted items stored in this chest, but I still can't jump high enough with the chest. That chest, however, is not enchanted. It's just a regular recurse item. So if I exit and re-enter, it's up there now because it's been reset. Yes, and I can get the key and uh, yeah, that is the answer to that one. Okay. Uh, right. So keys and blocks are simple. Even when they're enchanted, they're not too bad. Chests are also items which can be enchanted, which makes them unique. So on this level we have an enchanted chest. And if I jump into this chest, it's also recursive. So now I'm inside the chest, in the room in the chest, which is also the room the chest is in. No bother. If I move it over here, and then exit the chest, because that chest is unique to that room, that's where it is. Right? Yeah. No, maybe not. Okay. Let's jump in it a few times. Uh, one, two, three, yeah, that's probably enough. Now, I can throw this chest up here. And that's, that's somewhere I can't jump to. That's too high for me to jump. And because I'm inside that chest, I can then jump out of it. And now I'm up there. But I'm still inside the chest. So I can pick it up again and throw it. And now I can leave the chest and get the crystal, right? I just... Yeah! So that's a small taster. Uh, with the enchanted chest, the problem space kind of explodes. Uh, you can get an, enchan an enchanted chest that's inside itself but exists nowhere else. Um, you can create recursion with them wherever you find them. You can use them to... Uh, move through solid walls using the flooding mechanic and probably worst of all you can enter an enchanted chest then remove it from the room it's in and then try and exit it so you're exiting into a room and jumping out of a chest that's no longer there which is a paradox and that's when it gets really weird so 
I'll leave that as an exercise for you guys. It's out now on Steam, PC, uh, Windows, Mac, Linux. Um, yeah, that's Recursed. Hope you check it out. Thank you very much. Yeah. So I, I probably shouldn't tell you all this, but um, his daughter sent him a picture before the session saying, uh, good luck and I hope you win. So congratulations for winning Experimental Gameplay Workshop 2017. <laughs> so funny. It was adorable. It had like tons of hearts on it and stuff. It was so cute. <laughs> Um, okay, so next up we have Dance Together with Tobiah Zarlez. Are you ready to dance? All right, dancers, come on up. All right, this is Dance Together from Very Simple Rules. Everyone gets a device and headphones. First off, no talking, no hand gestures. Players are only allowed to communicate with each other through dance. Them and one other player are gonna to listen to the same song. They don't know what it's gonna be. Could be techno, could be Russian folk, could be mariachi, could be tango. They don't know until they have to start dancing. Their goal, find their dance partner through dance alone. When you're ready, press the green button and your game should start and they'll start dancing in a moment. Uh, big shout out to Brody and Aaron for helping me demonstrate over there. While they're playing, I'll talk to you, the larger crowd, about the game, what's going on. I made this game because I hate dancing. Seriously, I just don't know what to do. I don't know how to move my body. So I'm like, you know what, I'll make this game. It will encourage me to go out on the dance floor and actually have some fun, but also to take the person who loves dancing and give them that same moment of terror when they go on the dance floor and there's an Irish jig going on and they have no idea what they should be doing. Um, I've played this game with adults, with children, with people of all ages. I've had some players go up and first they just start moving their shoulders a little bit, but then after a couple of play sessions, they're just throwing their body into it and they're having fun. They realize that you too can just go out and start dancing dancing together. I was inspired by this, of course, Silent Discos, and also Johann Sebastian Joust. So they played a game, I thought, that changed my life. I want to make a game uh, like that. I'm not saying this is as good as that, but I love physical play games. I love games where you can just take your phone, have a bunch of people get together, and do something with their physical bodies in a room that, you know, is not typically done in most digital games. Um, I actually had this idea, like, uh, years ago, I think like three years ago at this point, um, but I never bothered making it. I told people about it, and I finally just sat down and prototyped it. Um, um, and I just hacked together this really, really simple, broken version. Here's my, my first early screenshots. The UI is better than this right now, though not much better. Um, I tried using like, uh, standard music at first, but I realized I needed custom music to really make this work well, so I commissioned a bunch of pieces because it needs to be genre typical you know, in the first 15 seconds. Because most songs, you don't really think about this when you listen to it, they have kind of a 30 second to a minute attack before they really kind of get into it. And I really need a song to know that if it's trance versus dubstep versus mariachi, you know, that first few seconds. So I got a 60 seconds loops that they play through um, that are genre typical right away. Um, and right now this is only one game mode, which is what I described where there's one other player listening to the same song and they have to find that person. But I have tons of ideas for this game on ways to do different game modes. Of course, teams would be cool, where maybe in an eight-player game, there's four versus four. Um, I've play-tested this up to 16, but I'm really curious of what the upper limit might be. You know, there's only so many songs I can include with this before songs are scared to getting too similar to each other to be able to identify it. So I'm thinking about making kind of a music category system, like there might be a techno song and a folk song and an old dance song or something like that, and do some kind of programmatic way to make sure the songs are unique enough for each other as I add more and more over time. What I'm most excited for uh, is a spy mode, it might be cool. So imagine an eight player game, there's eight people dancing, only one person is, doesn't have the right song, and the goal is to not be noticed. <laughs> the trick, they don't know they're the spy when the game starts. You just get music and you don't know what to do. Um, I also think this game could scale up really well, not just with more players, but maybe audience participation. You know, maybe p you as an audience could be judging these people and trying to figure out which player was dancing to which music and make this kind of a massive multiplayer game, you know, played at conventions. Um, and lastly, I really, the fear of the future of the game, I really need to work out um, the UI UX to figure out, you know, how you actually choose the other player. I have all sorts of ideas on how to figure out that, which kind of leads you to my next point. Um, 
I need help finishing this game. I made this simple prototype and I submitted to Indicate, I got selected to Indicate. Submitted to EGW, I got selected to EGW. So there's something interesting here, but I need help finishing it. So you know, if you're a UI UX person, you want to come help me out, please contact me. If you're a musician, audio engineer, contact me. Um, I, instead of trying to sell this game, there's a couple different ways I can make money with it, but I decided it'd be cooler to make this open and I want to see this at all sorts of different conventions. I want to see it played in the halls of GDC next year. So it's open source. It's available on my GitHub right now um, and I just want people to contribute to it and help me make it. But I also don't believe people should work for free as a general statement. Um, so if you don't want to help me for free, which you probably shouldn't, um, you could also throw money my way. I just set up a Patreon, patreon.com slash Tobiah, where you can throw some money per update. I promise not to be updating too often because I do have a full-time job. Um, but if you do that, 100% of the money will go towards paying other people to get those assets, polish this, and hopefully you'll see a much better version at GDC 2018. All right, that's Dance Together. You can find more Dance Together out today. And Way I'll be around go. after, we can play in the hallways. Thank you, dancers. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, so that's a really awesome thing, right? I mean, it's kind of experimenting with the idea that games need to make money, which is, um, I think there's a word for that. It's called art. Like doing art. Like you make it and then you just give it to people because it's cool. So um, we got a lot of submissions this year for VR stuff. And uh, we weren't really sure how to do uh, the sort of VR scene justice because a lot of stuff is still pretty new. Um, and Isaac here has agreed to give us a little showcase of some of the things that are new and weird and experimental in VR. That means not um, necessarily just a game form that we already know being translated into VR, which is the most common submission that we get, is a submission that's something like we kind of already know it, but then they put it in a new context, like, it's, you know, it's a racing game, but you're bananas, you know? No. Um, so <laughs> without further ado, here's Isaac to give us a VR overview from uh, 2017. Cool. Um, hi. Uh, I'm Isaac. Uh, I go by Kabiba on the internet, and this is a talk called Previously Considered Experimental. Um, so I've been ex making experimental WebGL experiences like Universe of Sound and Enough for quite some time. Uh, and I still do a lot of web work, but like many of you, I heard that Pied Pipe and Hype Train of VR, and I hopped on board. Uh, I've been doing that for about two years now, and I wanted to tell you a bit about what I've learned about v experimental VR games and the way that VR has actually influenced my views on experiment experimentality in general. Uh, it's definitely going to be a lot of stuff for 10 minutes, but we're going to try to show uh, some of the games over there afterwards. Um, obviously, there's a lot of people here, but we'll also have fun conversations and stickers, so uh, come through and say hi. Uh, last thing I want to say before we really get into it is that these games in no way obviously represent uh, the totality of experimental gameplay in VR because all of VR is experimental. <laughs> and I know that sounds like the ultimate soundbite from that hype train, and rest assured, it is. But I also think that there's some truth to it. Games have had so long to develop to build this universal vocabulary that with our shared vernacular, we can describe these massive undertakings, these entire universes with just three letters. Using terms like FPS, RPG, RTS, MMO, we have the ability to communicate so efficiently so clearly, but these crystallized explanations leave little room for flexibility. They can be brittle, almost stifling. VR, obviously, on the other hand, doesn't have that much of a shared vocabulary yet. This means that it's tougher to describe a lot of the work, but with that ambiguity comes room to experiment. In a medium that doesn't even have a cohesive vision on what it means to move, experimentation isn't just desirable, it is vital. It's a bit sad to see that already in this medium, which is so new, we see this tendency towards crystallization, the desire to use what has already been created instead of exploring and discovering what has never been, to manifest mechanics out of the ether. But even for games that tend towards the monolithic vocabulary, we see experimentation thrive. 
Uh, take Cosmic Trip, uh, which is made by a studio called Funktronic Labs, for example. This is a FPRTS, a first-person real-time strategy, which has a core loop that's extremely similar to a plethora of previous easily definable experiences, StarCraft, Red Alert, etc. But it literally changes your perspective on RTSs. Take their menu system, for example. UIs and menus in their current form are these displaced objects, which are not part of the same universe as the rest of the game. But in Cosmic Trip, the menu has physicality, legitimate weight. Instead of falling into the rut of developmental efficiency, using the already normalized point and click of a brutally defined UI vocabulary, Funktronic took the time to explore. It's the same thing with their teleportation system, and movement is something that VR has been struggling with for a while. Rather than the typical ballistics which so many games now unceremoniously implement, they built this unique system that would fit their game. By pulling up the columns and stepping through them, they created a cohesive world that was so different from any before it, it became hard to describe using the current vocabulary. It may be that in the distant future, this weighty user interface, or possibly the column transportation system, might become one of the TLA's three-letter acronyms that we will all know and love, but it will be because of those brave possibility space explorers over at Functronic Labs, and many other studios went out and tried word after word after word until a few finally made sense, and they could let us experience the thrill of, tr of understanding something for the first time. And I think that's why a lot of us are here. That moment where we get to grok one of those untranslatable words and it becomes part of our vocabulary, part of our reality. Games have an inherent ability to do this, to take the unfamiliar and make it familiar, to take the unknown and make it known, and has been doing so since its beginning. Tetris, Pong, Breakout were all once unfamiliar, but once played and understood, they become part of the vocabulary, transitioned from experimental to canonical. They created a word. And this wordsmithing is everywhere in VR. Even I tried to do it myself and also came up with a word. Blarp. Uh, now, its gameplay is only as deep as its name, and its artistic polish is, you know, equally amateur, but I can safely say that there are no TLAs that describe its mechanics. I've tried describing how it works, and I actually fail quite often, um, so I wanted to let some of the reviews from Steam try to do the same. As Person Guy says, you spin these things above your head like a stretchy lasso and try to toss them at a randomized target. Uh, Bassam, on the other hand, argues, you corral an ever-growing number of floating eyeballs in an ever-growing room, twirling them around like bolas or a bunch of yo-yos. Perhaps the most articulate is Cybert, who claims, blarp, 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 blarp. Couldn't have said it better myself. But blarp is confusing to describe because it wasn't a word that could exist before VR. It requires a room-scale HMD to be able to quickly spin and dodge. It will be impossible without, without hand controllers to pull the floating eyeballs on that stretchy lasso. And without the floating point trigger, you couldn't be so delicate, twirling and spinning in some ritualistic dance of cord-tangling delight. This is not, of course, to say that Blarp will become a classic like Tetris or Pong. On the contrary, it is the unfortunate fact that many experimental games never become part of the vocabulary because they are ignored, or even worse, because they might get intention but are considered too far out for popular consumption. Besides, blarp isn't a very good word. It might be fun to say, goofy and non-assuming, but in the end, the thing that it is pulling from the ether, though a novel mechanic, doesn't really say anything that could not be said before. It's just creating a new mode of entertainment. It's just making another feedback loop that scratches that itch of scoring a point, scoring another point, losing and starting over again, knowing that this time, this time will be the time that I win and prove my worth with quantified score. But there are other words out there, difficult words that try and say delicate things, that try to describe emotions that might have been impossible to describe before. 
Take Nebula Hands, uh, which is a prototype that Mike Tucker has been working on. It lets you be alone in the darkness, exploring the physics of these tiny particles, letting you feel like a solitary god witnessing the sparkling iridescent light in the abyss. Or Cave Carver by Fernando Romeo, where you slowly sculpt away layers of your cocoon until you discover the infinity in which you reside. Or Irrational Exuberance, the first VR piece that made me cry. In it, you travel through this universe, gently tapping rocks to reveal secrets. And as they crumble on your hands, you sense this feeling of time passing, a sunset that must dissipate. You grow crystals, the sounds tickling your ears as you marvel at your ability to create and direct conversation with your entropy-based destruction of the level before. It's mysterious, ambiguous, paradoxical, and also delightful. As usual, the Steam reviews show it. Metavisual says, this is, there aren't really words. It's beautiful, existential. And I know that Steam reviews are a bit of a silly way to prove a point because some of them are equally as banal as the above was po uh, poetic, um, such as this one, which I got for Loon. Amusing and neat for about 10 minutes. Not recommended. <laughs> Loon, a accidental creation that came from trying to implement a GPU-based cloth sim, is an architectural haiku whose thesis is very difficult for me to describe. It's the only thing in VR which I have made which I know says a word that matters. But it is a word that requires somebody quietly and calmly going through the experience. I tried it myself and felt that emotion, but didn't know how to communicate it and, and what it even meant until I read this review by 60 FPS. I was a sobbing mess, muttering to myself alone in the bathroom mirror in disbelief at how squarely this dev had hit a certain emotional nail on the head the tritone nail of beauty, awe, and boundless love. And I say this not just to flaunt my own ego, even though it is the best compliment that I will probably ever receive, but more to say that it is okay to try and say these words, even if we fail at saying them in the process. The attempt to say a new word will many times result in gibberish, like blarp or warka flarka flim flam, but when we find something that can say something more, we must try to say it. I believe that people are hungry, not just for novel mechanics, but for those novel mechanics to say something else, to make us remember that our reality is so much more than we thought was possible before. That in a place where no word has ever touched, there lies meaning. And I want to very, very, very adamantly add that this is not unique to VR. But I can already see the same pattern emerging, where so many tender and nuanced emotions are explored, but only the ones that are catchy or palpable enough rise to the top. This is not to say that those, games have, those catchy games have any less importance. I really, really, really do love BLARP, and I really, really do love catchy games. But rather, that ex exploration must be valued at its core. I don't know exactly what attaining this value looks like. It could be something like uh, the stuff that David Kanaga has been talking about with the GPU. It could be something else totally different. But the point is not just to be trying to find these new places, these new places, these new games, these new planets that have unobtainium or platinum ore, but to explore because that curiosity, that desire to expand the understanding of the worlds we live in is a big part of what makes us human. Because in the end, I hope that we are not exploring just to find the palpable words that can be financially successful to make games that will be considered PCE, but rather to acknowledge that we as creators have the ability to find new words that shape the very language we use to describe our reality. And with that description, we define that reality. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. Woo, all right. So as he mentioned, um, there will be uh, games up here at the front of the session when the session is over. And uh, there will be games that you can play physically. 
with your body, which is hopefully not in as rough shape as mine is after <laughs> four nights of three hours of sleep. Um, and so um, next up, we actually have uh, Bastien Gorison and Pauline Morier to talk about Panoptic. <laughs> Okay. Hi everyone, we are part of Team Panoptes and we are making Panoptic. My name is Pauline Marrière and I am the art director of the game. For the purpose of the presentation, I'll be inside the VR headset. And hi, I'm Bastian, I'm one of the designer, developers, and I'm the composer for the game. And so, what is Panoptic? Um, well, it's an asymmetrical VR game in which a small character, played by me here on this laptop, has to avoid detection by the huge mask that you see in the sky, and that's played by Pauline using the VR headset. So, my goal is to reach the end of the level uh, without getting shot by the overseer, while of course her goal will be to find where I am in the level and just shoot me down before I reach that goal. So it's really some kind of hide and seek uh, game in which I have several options. I can take it very careful and slow and be methodical and try to blend in with the, all these little guys that look exactly like me. Or I can just break into a run and try to use like jumping and uh, sprinting to avoid uh, the shots from the overseer. So, as you see, like the, the core gameplay is very simple, but we did have to iterate quite a bit to get to where we are now. And we are actually still finding out some of the things that make the, the game design click. One thing that's fairly evident from, and that was like fairly obvious from uh, a while ago, was that the game is at its most fun when the two players are interacting. Where the, when the VR player is really hot on the heels of the PC player and where there's real like tension in all the moves you do as the, as the PC player. So um, that's really one of our main goals uh, in the game is to like, provide those kind of situations and improve the time uh, both players spend on uh, each other's like, heels. Uh, but so, so to show you how we arrived at that, uh, at that point, let me take you back to the very beginning. So we started by uh, testing out the basic concept of the game. Uh, so basically we had a regular sized player and we just scaled up the VR uh, person like 30 times. And we spent way too much time doing just that, like picking up the player and tr try, trying to get him to stay on the controllers and like for preventing him to fall. You're not getting away, you know. And yeah, I, I obviously not because when you're so big in VR, your hands move way too quickly for the PC player to ever compete. So basically, we decided that that was maybe a bit too overpowered, and that was probably out as a way of interacting between the players. <laughs> but of course, you still needed a way to stop the challenger from reaching his goal. So we we were thinking about what's uh, really fun about the game, and. We found out that actually just looking around uh, was a lot of fun. Like you have all these uh, small structures and you see like the little character and all that. And it's a bit like when you look at a model train or Legos or you know, dollhouse, it's stuff that people like to examine. So we, we said, okay, we might like find something to, to work with uh, in that. And we, we said, okay, what if you could shoot a laser from where you are looking at? Fairly straightforward. And so we went with that. And like almost immediately we knew that there was no avoiding a comparison to like Lord of the Rings and the Eye of Sauron kind of deal. So instead of trying to dodge that and be like all, all artsy about it, we just owned it. And we put as a, a visual feedback for the uh, overseer, we just put a big spotlight in front of, uh, of its face, as you've seen before. Uh, and we like upped the contrast between the level and the um, and um, the light just to have like a real like big big, big uh, effect visual effect and yeah it basically clicked hey for the no, give me my ring please Never. <laughs> anyway back back to the, the the game itself we we what we found out was good about like the um, uh, this uh, light mechanic is that it's, it served a couple purpose. So not only was it a good way for the uh, VR player to aim and to like know what he was going to shoot at, which is 
like the functional part. It was also like a good way to communicate uh, to the PC player what was going on without like, for example, right now I'm looking at the at the overseer, but if I'm walking and trying to be all sneaky like and don't get noticed, then I still see if the overseer is watching me and I can make informed decision as to whether I need to stay in formation or just like break into a run and, and try to avoid what the, like the gaze of the overseer. So that, that, that was a nice, uh, um, a nice find we made about that mechanic. Then if you have that light as a way to, uh, to aim and as a, um, uh, an interesting effect, we had to design the levels to make use of that uh, as much as we could. And one of the first things we, we, we decided is to actually place the level on the outside of the room scale play area. So it's basically a, a 360 degree uh, level all around. So that means that the overseer has to turn his, his, uh, his or her head just to, to find uh, uh, the PC player and it makes for like a good searchlight effect, right? But also the fact that the level is outside of the play field means that it acts as own very, uh, very own chaperone system. It also eliminates the need for any locomotion system. So no, normally nobody should get sick from Panoptic is what we hope. Um, and since we had all that like, surface to play with, with all the walls and stuff, it's, uh, it made us do some fun things with heights. So there's like a part of the level at the beginning that's very close to the ground. And that ended up making for a fun like photo opportunity. If you see somebody who's like lying on the floor, craning his neck in a weird way to try to see into a building with a VR headset on, you probably know they're playing Panoptic. And since they don't know, you can just snap pictures and that's like a fun thing to do. But it was also um, uh, a challenge because, as I said before, we want to keep the player close together uh, as much as possible. But if that works kind of with a linear level, we also wanted to try some more uh, open uh, level. So here you see like we just have like four, four spheres and there's like, a lot of open spaces and I could go as a PC player in any direction and the overseer don't really know where I'm going. So we decided that we could if you wanted like, to make more uh, var uh, varied levels, we probably needed to bring some tools to the, for the overseer to um, locate the PC player. And so one of the things we've been like, experimenting with is giving back some hands to the VR player. Because let's face it, it's still fun to have something to do with your hands when you are, you are in VR. And we made those kind of lenses uh, that Pauline now has on her, um, on her controllers and that she can use to basically see roughly where I went. Come here, come here, little one. I, I will find you, you know. <laughs> will you now? Where are you? And so, as you see, like the trail of particles like takes a while to appear, um, and that means I cannot stay really stationary. No. I have to, I have to continue moving. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that's that's like one only one of the approaches of of uh, of course like to try and solve this balance issue. But uh, yeah, we we really think there's like. Some, some good ideas that can come from just having the, uh, the very different scales for the two players. But um, anyway, I think that was Panoptic in a nutshell. We obviously like, really like talking about the game, so if you're interested, mm -hmm. just come find us after, and yeah. Yeah, thank you for your attention. <laughs> it's so cute. So devilishly cute. I will get you. I will pick you up. Okay, so um, the next uh, speaker is Tim Garbus, and he is going to talk to us about keyboard sports. He also has the rainbow keyboard, which is so cool. My favorite thing. Okay. Ready to go. Hi. Just going to check the audio. Yeah, hi, I'm Tim Garbus, and I'm going to be talking about keyboard sports, a game that uses every single key on the keyboard. And I didn't make this alone, so some of the other people are down there, um, but I'm just going to start playing. So first, a little bit about alternative controllers, because I'm really, really excited about alternative controllers. And every time I come to GTC, it's the, new, it's the big thing, and I love them. But when I get home, I only have my laptop. 
So this is sort of a project to set up to see what we can do with just ordinary controllers. Um, this is Master Qwerty, and you're the young apprentice, and he, uh, he's going to do some nice key puns here. So you can enter my house, and here comes the trick, I'm going to press enter. Please sit down in the cozy space, pressing space. Would you mind getting tea for me? Pressing T. Then you sort of see that you can walk around on the keyboard like this. So we're gonna give him his tea. Yeah. And when you live on a tiny keyboard, you can shift between rooms. So I press the left shift, shift over here. And it here comes the first challenge, because now you need to use the number row up here that you usually don't know that much, use that much in games. You also get to use your Windows key. It feels really weird. Um, yeah. We, we're gonna shift back here. So, let's say I wanted to exit his house. I'm, I'm gonna try escape here. You can't enter my house again. Again, use escape to get outside. So I'm now gonna press escape. That's totally okay in this game. So now we sort of know the basic movement and we can move around on the keyboard. So let's see what we can do with this. So now we know how to move and we can avoid some things and then we try a few different things we can do, do with this movement. So I'm just, just going to shift through some different games. So we have the same movement here, just with a little bit of action added on top. But now if I hold down one of the keys, it, it goes down. So I'm just going to play, play a little bit here. Next up we have some precision. This one is pretty straightforward. And I'm gonna jump down here and skip to the next scene. So here you force down on all the windows buttons and space and everything. So uh, now I've shown a few, ex few examples of what you can do with just one key at a time on the keyboard. But the keyboard does, will support more than one key at a time. So now we go for two keys. So I still move around, 
same same point, press a key, but if I hold down that key, press a secondary key, then I get a pretty huge multi-directional. So I'm just gonna shoot this target in and then just play for a little bit. That's Keyboard Sports. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Anita Tung and Kasson Crooker here to talk about Shard. here to talk about the cooperative two-player game Shard. Shard was created and conceptualized by Roger Hanna Moresh. He was the programmer, game designer, and built the underlying game engine from scratch. I'm Anita, I joined Roger as the game's visual artist and became significantly involved in the game's narrative and design. Hi, my name is Kasson Crooker. I worked with Roger for many years at Harmonix. And then actually on one of uh, Robin's SF Indies picnics, I met up with Roger again, and of course he had his laptop and immediately showed me a early version of the game, and so I joined on the spot to uh, write music and do the sound design. So for those of you who did not have the fortune of knowing Roger, um, he and his wife Val tragically passed away in January at their home in Berkeley, feeling a mixture of both joy to be here in front of you and share his game with you. Um, and sadness at their passing. Um, it was really his dream to be able to show a game like Shard in a room full of these amazing, innovative designers. So um, thank you to EGW for having us, of course. Um, Roger was one of the most fiercely intelligent people I've ever met, um, stressed on fiercely. Um, and he really just wanted to make progressive, thought-provoking games. Um, in addition to Shard, um, I worked with him on Rock Band franchises and Dance Central. Um, he also made a Chrome and native client of uh, Port of Bastion. Um, he was a lead engineer on last year's Amplitude game, um, and he worked on about 15 games in total. Um, he was also a, an avid game player as well as game maker, and um, he consistently just wanted to enjoy every game that he, you know, that he played. He was consistently on the top of the leaderboards for Amplitude, um, and he was the first person to speedrun Braid. <laughs> Roger was incredibly devoted to finding ways to push game design into new realms and unexplored themes. For five years, Shard was his passion, so we wanted to speak a little here to celebrate his life and his game. Shard began as a visual algorithm for breaking down images. Roger had previously made a music visualizer that took advantage of the triangle-based nature of GPU rendering and started to think about ways to use aspects of that experiment in a game. We use an offline process that takes in a roster image as a, uh, as a PNG and uses a learning algorithm to describe the images using, uh, using triangles. Uh, Making a game entirely out of particles opens up a lot of opportunities for really weird interactions without having to animate anything by hand. Also, visually, the amount of triangles correlates to how closely the generated art will resemble the original art, which allows us to use different levels of abstraction for different areas of the game. This approach, coupled with his custom-coded game engine, made the game's rendering highly efficient and easily executed on any platform. This is just a transition animation from a really early build of Shard showing uh, the way that things in the world form from the triangles. The theme of breaking familiar things apart to, in order to change them is something that is carried into multiple parts of the game. 
The algorithm takes a pre-existing image and abstracts it, and we wanted Shard to continue that abstraction in its non-visual aspects. Narratively, it starts as a hero's journey, but along the way, the world breaks apart, revealing new dimensions. This makes the world itself the center of the story, and the players shift focus to an exploration of their broken world. Mechanically, they start uh, with familiar run and jump platformer abilities, but after the world breaks, many new interactive options become available. In addition to the unique aesthetic of this triangle-based system, it allows for scaling the resolution of the game easily and quickly as a tool for imparting game state, health, or other mechanics. Um, beyond the custom engine and unique gen anim system that sort of drives the whole initial prototypes of the game, um, Shard was so much more than that. Um, Roger really would describe it as a fractured platformer with local cooperative multiplayer gameplay. Um, Roger, Anita, and myself really felt strongly that the game um, needed to you know, have an overarching philosophy of being inclusive and cooperative, um, and it's a social game, and something that's really easily discoverable. Um, we wanted to represent different races and genders, identities in the game. It's not the focus, but we wanted to uh, have that be a part. And it's really about the cooperative aspect of the game. Uh, we wanted the social experience where the dialogue between the two players in front of the computer really was essential to making progress. Um, and then with the two players, we wanted to make sure there was a low barrier of entry, no tutorials, everything was very discoverable, and very important that um, players of different skill levels could sit down and play together, even if they didn't know the basics of a uh, platformer. Um, but I think the most innovative aspect of the game was this fractured element, um, playing on this system of being able to generate these triangles and break things down low res to high res really meant that we could also break other things um, in addition to the, the graphics. We could break the physics at any time. We could break the narrative. We could break um, you know, standardized platformer um, mechanics and really play with those and embed them inside the narrative. Um, using these tools allowed us to build environments and look for really interesting combinatorial mechanics that um, led to unique gameplay experiences. Here's some footage of uh, the most recent build of Shard from late last year. Um, the players, the two players have six unique abilities um, that increase in complexity and they're um, presented as skilled uh, skills that the two players share. Um, the players cannot use the same ability set, um, and so, but they can switch at any time between them. So this is the prompting of the dialogue between the two players to coordinate how they're going to overcome these uh, different environmental obstacles. As the game goes on, they, uh, they're given new abilities that allow them to change the properties of the triangles that make up their character forms and have effect on the triangles surrounding them in the world. These abilities progress as the game goes on in power, but also in abstraction. And then as the gameplay becomes harder, the two players really have to coordinate these abilities to advance. Um, there are, uh, we had to build a number of different environmental levels, you see some here, just as prototype beds to be able to sort of you know, flesh out the look of the game, but also experiment with the combinatorial aspects of these abilities to yield mechanics. And what I, you know, in, in demos, we were really seeing a lot of emergent gameplay. There's a moment that we haven't built yet in the future of the game where the item that grants the abilities and powers to the players breaks and force them to adjust, adjust to a new level of abstraction. The character forms end up breaking down completely and although the game responds to input, it might not be in ways that are completely expected. After this moment, the players have to deliberately restore a degree of order to the world. On the audio side, as an audio person, I was always working with Roger to try to explore some uh, audio aspects of doing the same thing. And so we had come up with this great system that I was uh, really looking forward to implement, and hopefully we will in the future of the game, which will be the ability to both um, de-res the audio, basically fracture the audio in real time, scaling it from full fidelity all the way down um, to highly compressed and thereby um, very artifacted sounding um, to sort of play along with the same scaling up and scaling down of the triangle system. So
So um, just before the end of 2016, we had finished uh, our first vertical slice and began working on the horizontal slice of the game. Um, but then the sudden passing of Roger in January obviously has halted our progress. And so you know, we're currently working through all the emotions um, to be surrounded by such an amazing community of gamers um, who have supported him um, has been really amazing. Um, and Anita and I, um, and those close to Roger, are extremely passionate about the future of Shard. Uh, um, and so, uh, Anita? <laughs> Our goal is that in, in a few months, we'll be able to formulate a plan on how we can complete and release Shard in a way that honors Roger's legacy. So until then, um, here's some ways you can continue to, to uh, follow us online. Thanks so much to the whole EGW team and especially to San Francisco indie developers for your support. Um, I want to leave you with a quote from Roger, which he once wrote in response to the question, why do you play games? If something can be imagined, it can be created in a video game. In that regard, that's the ultimate form of freedom of expression of ideas. And games today touch on a large gamut of that. Dread, euphoria, desire, fear, rage, compassion, order, chaos, logic, beauty in all its forms. Thanks. Thank you all. Thank you. I just wanted to take a moment and acknowledge the fact that the community came together very well and in a great, uh, amazing, loving moment when Roger passed. And it was his dream to present this game here and to be able to do that. It's one of the greatest things of my life. It's my greatest regret that he didn't live to see this moment. I just wanted to say that he loved you all very, very much. Thank you. And with that, one of my most favorite people, Jen Sandercock and Josh, are here to show us Edible Games. All right, hi everyone. I'm I'm Jen Sandercock, um, and I'm talking about Edible Games. Uh, what do I mean? Um, I mean games where one of the core gameplay mechanics is eating. Um, and I'm not talking about food as a reward, I'm talking about like somehow eating changes the games somehow. Um, why am I doing this? I'm doing this because I love to bake, um, I really like real, real world games, um, and I like designing games. This is a bunch of games that I've worked on over the years. So by my powers combined, yay, edible games. <laughs> Uh, so in the beginning, uh, one of the first games I did was called the cookie baking game. Uh, in the cookie baking game, you compete for ingredients and then you eat the cookies that you bake at the end as a, as a reward. Uh, but the thing was, uh, the gameplay was kind of little mini games to compete for the ingredients and you didn't really interact with the food particularly much and it wasn't really cohesive as a whole. So the big question I needed, needed to ask was, what new game play mechanics are only possible with edible games and cannot be done with any other type of game. Basically, I was asking, what does food give us? G food gives us a bunch of societal norms, hidden information with your taste buds, um, allergies, personal preference, they're messy, germs, all of these things. So because I'm doing a series of games, I'm going to talk to you about six of the games that I've got that I think are pretty solid right now. So the first one is Gingerbread Friends. Gingerbread Friends uh, is set up with a, a board with lids on top. It's a slow game about making friends. There are hidden prizes inside, which are the gummy bears, and then there are also pieces of paper. The pieces of paper are minesweeper-like and tell you where to find a gummy bear. You earn the right to eat a lid by guessing others' answers to so social questions. So for example, you, when it's your turn, you might ask the group, would it be a relief to realize you were ordinary, no better or worse than most others? And then you guess if everybody will say uh, yes or no, and then you might get a lid. Next game, Master Taster. In Master Taster, it's about memory and taste buds. There are a series of rounds, and each, in each round, you find out the taste preferences of the two main characters. Then you must eat one of the items with your eyes closed. 
as you're eating it, you need to work out what flavor that is, and it might be a combination of flavors too. You then say whether the characters can or can't eat it by putting thumbs up or thumbs down. If you're correct, you stay in the game. Information is never repeated, and information builds every single round. Next game, flavor roulette. In flavor, flavor roulette, there are four players with four morsels. One of these does not taste like the others. It's probably pretty gross. You take turns eating, and then you have to pretend like yours is normal. So this is my friend Owen here. So, would you believe he actually has a normal one? He's trying to convince everybody that they should vote for him. So uh, once everybody's eaten, you then guess who had the bad one. The next game is Flip and Stick. In Flip and Stick, there are a grid of peanut butter covered crackers. You choose a square to hit, for example, D5, and you try to aim for it and hit. If you miss, there are more points for everyone else, and slash chocolate. Um, and if you hit it, you need to flip up and, uh, upside down your square and see what sticks. You get as many points as whatever sticks to your square. And then you get to like throw a bunch of chocolate at the table so that there's more points for everyone. Uh, the next game is called uh, Jay Wobbler, um, and this is a tray of um, what I call jelly, you guys call jello, with gummy bears hidden inside. You have 10 seconds to try to wobble to get the jawbreaker to land on top of one of the gummy bears. If it does, you then get to eat the square. Now there's a big hole in the board, which your jawbreaker is very likely to fall into. So I'm going to now do a deep dive on a game called The Order of the Oven Mitt. The tagline is, do you have the appetite to join the Knights of the Oven Mitt? I did this for uh, the Global Game Jam in 2016, where the theme was ritual. I did a bunch of failed prototypes where there was too much thinking, not enough fun, and definitely not enough eating. Uh, it's a two-team game, and you move just like a chess knight on the board, so in an L shape. There are two types of squares, the sacred squares, which are the dark squares, and the common squares, which are the light squares. If you land on a sacred square, you must consume it according to the sacred ritual as laid out in the sacred tome of the oven mitt. Uh, this is what uh, some of the rituals uh, look like. Once you have consumed that square, you then have a hole on the board, and you can't stay on top of a hole, so you have to push the squares around. That might push you, it might move the other player as well, and it will mean that perhaps uh, the other player might not be able to get the candy you like. If you land on one of the common squares, you can't eat the common squares because that will sully you. Uh, so the game is over when all of the sacred squares have been eaten. The rituals are really about a fun performance for players and observers. It's creating a sacred space where you're allowed to be totally silly. The initial feedback I got on the game was that I could push the rituals to make them even more embarrassing for people. Uh, there's kind of two different sorts of play styles that you can play. Because the game itself doesn't really care who eats the sacred squares, they just have to be eaten. You can either compete to see who gets the most or cooperate and help each other both get the squares that you want. There are unique play strategies because people have food preferences. So, for example, this is a Reese's peanut butter cup. Many people like these. Uh, many, uh, some people don't. But if you both like them, you might compete for them and go, hey, I'm going to not let you have that. But you might go, ooh, if I let you have the jelly beans, will you let me have the Reese's peanut butter cup? There are unique challenges for demoing this. I showed it at Indicade last year, and I spent days baking. I had an army of helpers helping me. It was amazing. Um, I'm now going to try to do a live example. So we're going to switch to, I've got a camera, and I have some, um, some volunteers over here. Say hello to everyone. So we've got Josh doing the camera. We've got six people. So we've got... Uh, Two teams, uh, we set the board up earlier so that they started playing before the session began. Um, and let me see, is it Sue, Sandy and Pat's turn currently? All right. So would you like to, they are playing as the dinosaur kangaroo object. At the beginning of the game, you get to decorate your piece so that it becomes more like you, with edible pens, of course. The pieces are, the whole board is entirely edible. So they are moving and they're going to land on top of the candy corn. So we can see on the side there's a little legend. The candy corn is number six, so I pull out the sacred tomb of the oven mitt, and I look up ritual number six. Okay. Pick up the sacred square. 
Now, everybody gets a sacred square, so if you're playing with more than just two people, people grab them from the extra supply that I have. Hold sacred square high above your head with both hands. Look at the sacred square. Squint, squint against the grandeur. <laughs> Move the sacred square to your mouth with your hands. Consume the sacred square. So when they are done consuming, they can then get to push things around on the board. So hopefully we'll be able to zoom in and see what they're doing. You have to push everything so it all hits up against the edge. Um, so that might move you. And in this case, it's actually moved the eyes into a position where the other team can reach it. So I don't know, do they want the funny candy eye things? Looks like they do. <laughs> All right, so that is ritual number eight. All right, let me make sure I get the right one. Okay, pick up the sacred square. Everyone's got one. Close your eyes. Do a 180 degree turn so that no one will see what happens. <laughs> Keep your eyes closed. Think of your most embarrassing memory. It's not like anyone's watching you right now. <laughs> Place square in your mouth and consume. When you are done consuming, you may turn around. Keep thinking about that embarrassing moment. Yay, and so now they would get to uh, move stuff on the board if they want to finish their turn. Choose which way they're gonna push it. So they're gonna go that way. So you always have to end up on top of a square. So we're now gonna switch back to the slides, hopefully, somebody, brilliant. All right, so what's my next stage? I have a bunch of half-baked ideas, literally. I just couldn't resist. Um, there's obviously a bunch of scalability and delivery issues with this style of games. Um, it takes a really long time to make these boards. They, you know, don't last forever. Um, I don't have food handling licenses. Some people have allergies and can't eat these things. Um, but I'm planning to do an edible games cookbook, a baker's dozen of edible games. So it'll have like the recipes and the rules on um, how to play. Um, I have Flip and Stick, the peanut butter cracker game, uh, available to play after the talks are over, over there. So come and join me. Um, and if you're interested, follow me on Twitter or sign up to get my newsletter. Thank you, Jen, that was delicious. Okay, next we have a fold apart. And if I make this a little bit bigger, I can actually read the names off of the thing. So this year is new. Can you see how smooth it is? It's so smooth. Everything just happens. There's, there's another group of people that we haven't said thank you to yet, which I think we should probably do right now. And that's the AV staff for this room who are tireless in helping us assemble the session. So let's give them a huge round of applause. They, they work with us to practice these talks. They let us come into the room several times over the course of the conference and work with our schedules and our weird hardware and all the little things that we want to do, including stuff like that camera, and they make it happen. And it wouldn't happen if they weren't here and they weren't dedicated to their jobs. They also made everything else work at GDC, so for that we'll give them a second round of applause. Thank you once again. So um, in introducing Mark and Stephen, I actually asked uh, Mark, how do I pronounce your last name? Um, it's La Frambois, uh, but he said it's La Fram Boys because then you have La Fram Boys and La Fram Girls. <laughs> and I was like, oh, damn, that's really funny. Um, but all the time, no, We're doing a little bit of extra stuff. All right, so show of hands, everyone in the room, how many of you are game designers? All right. How many of you are artists? All right. How many of you are sound designers? Musicians? Okay. Writers? All right. Producers? All right. How about the people that uh, raise the money? How many of you are raising money right now? 
All right. You do, you do hard work. I appreciate you now, much more than I ever did before. Um, how many of you give away money? Oh, you suckers. <laughs> now I know where you're sitting. <laughs> um, okay, um, how many of you had your hands up more than once? All right, thank you. That's what makes games awesome, is that set of hands. It's the fact that there are so many people in the community that do more than one thing, which is a good thing to do. I'm trying to think if there's anything else I can talk about. Um, I was just going to say that. I'm not going to talk about the things yet. As for a shout out, um, right before the shout out, indeed. indeed. Um, well, I can tell you a joke. All right, we're going to bring the next person up. But I'll still tell you a joke. Back on. Um, the joke is, why do giraffes have long necks? because their feet stink. <laughs> My friend Kian made that up when he was eight and it's still the funniest joke in the universe. <laughs> okay, so the next speaker, we're gonna go a little bit uh, forward, is um, uh, Hamish Todd. Hamish Todd, I always do it wrong, every time. Um, and he's presenting Virus, the beauty, you oh my gosh, look at that. Never mind, we'll see him in a minute. Without further ado, here's uh, Stephen Mark. The laptop just died. <laughs> All right, good afternoon, GDC. So I'm Mark, and this is Stephen, and we are the co-founders of Lightning Rod Games. So we're going to be talking about our game, A Fold Apart. Uh, so before we start, how many people here have been in a long distance relationship at some point in their lives? Well, quite a few of you. Okay, this is great. So you guys will probably get something a little bit of extra of our presentation today. So we're going to get into our gameplay pretty quickly, but I just want to do a little brief overview of the game, um, the inspiration for the game, and how we arrived at the mechanic that we're using. So before I started Lightning Rod Games with Steven, I was working in California at Disney Interactive, and my wife was still living in Orangeville, Canada. And so for a year and a half, we were in a long distance relationship, and it sucked. You know, it was a lot of emotional ups and downs, and it was a very, very trying time for both of us. Now, the good news is we've been back together in Canada for over three years, but whenever I look back at that time when we were apart and the emotions that we went through, I always thought that would be a very interesting story for a game. Because long distance relationships really aren't something you see in games or even other media like film and television all that often. However, we wanted to make a game that didn't just have a story about long distance relationship, but mechanics that helped enhance that feeling of being apart from someone that you loved. And we didn't really know how to do that at first. And it wasn't until after a GDC one year, and actually it was after an uh, experimental gameplay workshop, that Steve and I were brainstorming ideas for game mechanics that we thought would be interesting and we hadn't seen before in games. And the idea of folding paper came, came up, like origami or the back of a Mad Magazine. And we thought it was cool, but we didn't really know how to turn that into a fully fledged game. And it wasn't until a few months later that I realized that folding paper is actually a really good way to represent a long distance relationship. Because if you have a piece of paper and you have a character on one side and a character on the other, they're in two entirely different worlds and they can't get to one another. But if you fold that paper, you can merge those two worlds together and create a way for them to reunite. And I thought this was, this is a good representation of how it feels when you're in a long distance relationship. You wish you could just take your two worlds and just mash them together and be in the same place. So that provides the basis for our game of Fold Apart. It's a puzzle game about a long distance relationship in a world made out of paper. So there's two characters, an architect and a teacher, and they're separated across a desk. And the only way for them to reach one another is by folding and manipulating the papers that lie between them. So throughout the game, you're gonna be able to play as both characters, and you're gonna be able to experience the unique perspective that both of them have. Um, the other thing is you're also going to be play, able to choose the genders of both characters. Um, we're still in the process of establishing art style and iterating on it, so I wasn't able to, unfortunately, be able to show it in the presentation today. But as a studio, we believe love is universal, and we want that to be an option for every player who plays our game. All right, so we'll, we'll stop. No, thank you. <laughs> All right, so I'll set up this level a little bit as Steven plays. So 
we're going to start this off. The architect just started his new job in his new city, and uh, he's going to go for a walk and start exploring. So he's going to walk out of his office, and he's going to go into some of the papers that are adjacent to it. And as he walks along, he's going to get to this retro movie theater, and he sees a memory of a time when him and the teacher were happy together, and so he goes and collects it. And as he continues along, he gets to this paper, and now all of a sudden he can't cross it. There's no way for him to get, that, to get across to the next area. But because the world's made out of paper, what we can do is we can turn that paper over, and on the back you see there's a platform now that he can wander across all the way to the next area. So he gets to another puzzle here. So this one, you can see that there is a platform on one side, and there's a little bit of a platform on the other, but it doesn't go all the way across. So what we can do now is actually fold the paper, and we can merge those two platforms together, creating one single long one that he can walk across to the next area. So the other thing we can do with the paper is we can move characters and objects from one side of the paper to the other. So here you can see the exit door is on the back side of the paper, so we have to get the character over there somehow. So the first thing we can do is fold the paper, so we can merge these two platforms, kind of like we did in the last puzzle. Well, now what we can also do is unfold that paper, so that will move the characters to the back side to where the door is. So a lot of you have been in long distance relationships, so you know the most important thing when you're that far apart from someone else is communication. So that's one of the things that we're experimenting right now with how to tell that story. And so we're using like the memories where the characters can react to moments that they remembered from a time when they're happy. And we're also exploring telling a story through these love notes on the puzzles, where one side, where it's a conversation that goes back and forth between these two characters. And it's not only nice because it helps tell a story, but it gives a presence to the character who's absent in the, in the puzzles as well. So they're able to show their support as the other characters try to traveling across the desk. The other cool thing is that we can actually fold in any direction. So in this puzzle here, we can actually fold diagonally. Um, so which will move, when we move on there, we'll be able to move up to a higher level. So we're in level with that door that's on the other side. All right, so this was pretty happy. Um, we all know long distance relationships are not always happy. So that's another area that we want to explore with our game. So there's a lot of times when you're in a long distance relationship and you feel terrible. You feel really alone. Uh, you know, just you feel like the other person isn't always there. Um, maybe you're out of sync, maybe you're in a different time zone and there's times where you just need them and they're just not around. And so sometimes you, you know, you'll message them and you don't hear back right away because either they're busy or they're sleeping. And you just wish that there was a way to be with them and you just can't be. of our, our folding mechanics. So what we're working on now is kind of iterating on our art style and our story, and even the gameplay. We really want to push this idea of paper folding and, and the world being made out of paper, and including things like environmental effects or you know ripping and tearing and things like that, um, which we feel will kind of help emphasize this idea of, of traveling through a world made out of paper. One thing that we're really interested in is hearing from other people who have been in long distance relationships because it's always a unique story and there's always different emotions that everyone goes through. And so one thing is we really like hearing from other people so absolutely if you, if you want to talk to us after, tell us about your own story, that's awesome because it always is inspirational to us for things to add into the game. So f please feel free to contact us, feel, talk to us after the talk. Um, our contact information is up here as well. So we're looking forward to hearing from you and telling you more about the game. Thank you. Thank you for reminding us once again why it's so important that the AV staff is so talented. <laughs>
Um, so uh, next up, we do have Hamish Todd talking about virus, the beauty and the beast. I don't have any more jokes. It's OK. I think I'm ready. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Robin. Uh, yeah, I'm Hamish. Uh, I used to write for actionbutton.net. Anybody remember, remember that website? Ooh. Ooh, and this guy in the front row also did. All right. Uh, I also wrote a bunch of articles about game design. My most famous one was about Medusa heads in Castlevania. Um, and I made some, oh, brilliant. And I made some games that nobody played. Uh, and actually, I sort of left the games industry um, to go into biology. This is me at the International Rice Research Institute. Uh, they, cured one, they cured world hunger once, um, but the population increased, so nobody noticed. Uh, it, not that there's anything wrong with the population increasing. Uh, and so we're going to uh, 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 think about some biology. So this thing on the left here is polio. And on the right is a young man whose life uh, is made worse than it ought to be by polio and shorter than it ought to be as well. This is hepatitis B. Uh, probably know it, it infects your liver. This is one that you probably don't recognize. It's a Ugandan virus called Rift Valley Fever. Uh, causes a lot of suffering. Um, but one thing that you might notice about the viruses is that they all have patterns on them. And there's actually a close connection between those patterns that I'm going to illustrate now. So on the left here, we've got polio again. And on the right here, we've got something which I'd like you to stare at until you've convinced yourself that it looks like polio. It's a bit abstract, but if I hold it like... Uh, if I hold it like this, maybe, you can maybe see that there's two shapes on the front uh, facing us. Um, but what do we do with this, though? Well, I've got a button here. And I'm going to open it up. Because uh, that lets us sort of see the whole spherical pattern all flattened out in front of us. It lets us see the whole pattern at once. And it also allows us to see that the pattern on polio fits very nicely into this pattern of hexagons. But so what? Well, if I grab it and increase its size, uh, and then wrap it back up again, well, now we have a new shape. And it just so happens that this shape is precisely the pattern of hexagons that you get on Rift Valley fever. And in fact, you can make almost any other virus this way. Let's go for that one. And this is a model used by actual scientists. You can make about 60% of all viruses this way. And since 90% of all organisms on Earth are viruses, pretty much all, like the majority of organisms on Earth are some variation on this pattern. But not all viruses are sort of well-behaved like this. These are three viruses that are a bit more weird geometrically. And here are the shapes that we use to talk about them as biologists. Uh, and I've got a different thing to show you now. Well, very similar, actually. Uh, again, we've got a similar sort of shape. And if we open it out, we can see it flattened again. But now I can grab these, maybe move them a bit, take that one as well. And now we've got a different shape. And because of the way this thing is set up, that shape could well correspond to some virus that's out there. Here's a virus from before. There's the shape that it corresponds to. If I grab this, maybe put that there. Ah, oh, it doesn't look great, does it? Oh, maybe from that angle. Yeah. OK. If I had a bit more time, <laughs> oh, um, if I put it like that and wrap it up, well, now we have a shape that corresponds to this virus over here. That thing 
kills more than a million people every year. That's HIV. And that's actually one of the best pictures that we have of it. It's extremely difficult to get pictures of HIV. And now I'll show you uh, the context in which players will see this. Zika virus has an extremely peculiar pattern on it, and it's part of a group of viruses that all have subtly related patterns on them. They have to be understood using this quite particular model, and you can try it out now. Now what you're seeing here may not seem very much like a virus at all. And so we are going to take a close look at this particular virus called HPV, a very nasty virus which is known to cause cancer. So if we take this X-ray of HPV and we increase the contrast on it, then we get a bunch of white blobs. And it just so happens that those white blobs tell you exactly where HPV's proteins are. Now, proteins are connected together, and so we're going to draw lines between those proteins that have a connection, and this gets us something that can be made in the model. If you feel like challenging yourself, now you can try constructing HPV. Um. And there's a link from the previous guys, by the way, the algorithm that's used to um, wrap up these shapes. Um, I actually took it from a bunch of origamists. So I don't actually do this as my day job. I've actually left the games industry, like I say. Um, so I'm a biologist, really. Uh, on the left, uh, I'm working on virtual reality lecturing, virtual reality molecular fitting. And it's really exciting to be working with the new hardware. Virtual reality, it's not, it's not what a lot of people say it is, but uh, it's pretty cool. But as I'm getting used to the new hardware, I'm acutely aware that uh, there are so many things that are possible with the old hardware that we never even touched. Thank you. Thank you, Hamish. So it's very interesting, the idea of experimental games being used in education, and as education can become more and more accessible through uh, virtual reality and ways of the internets, um, maybe we can actually start uh, sort of finding the viruses before they find us. Yeah. So last up, um, we have John to talk about the Alt Control Showcase. Are you ready? Please come up to stage, Alt Controllers. Wait, you're not controllers, you're people. Right. What? <laughs> Saying not responding right now. I don't know what's happened. Awesome. Thanks for your patience. Hello, everyone. The Alternative Controller Exhibit, Alt Control GDC, uh, doubled its boot space this year and gave away its first award Wednesday night, providing a huge, well-deserved visibility bump to the dozens of teams crafting unique, tangible, and unforgettable experiences. The exhibit thrives thanks in large part to your amazingly positive feedback, so I want to say thank you so much for your support. The exhibit is the brainchild of Simon Carlos, EVP of GDC and Gama Sutra, and myself, John Polson, your friendly neighborhood, humble bundle publishing lead. I took my somewhat unhealthy obsession for Konami music controllers and countless other peripherals, and my love for showcasing and organizing awesome devs, as I've done for Minecon and The Mix, and channeled those passions into finding and showcasing the most alternative of controllers for the past four years at GDC, bringing us to the showcase today. We spent a lot of time talking about how games, games touch people. I'm thankful we get to celebrate here the converse, how people touch games. Studies say touch is the first sense to develop. 
My own study says that when I first touch and learn new controllers, I develop some of my strongest memories coupled with extraordinary sensations. Learning new controls often becomes a mentally gratifying game by itself. Sometimes we can create really different ways to touch games, and this brings hundreds of millions of new people to play. Experiments to change how we play don't always happen in the halls of huge companies, though. Sometimes all it takes is a tiny team. Here are five such teams featured at the All Control GDC 2017 exhibit, handpicked by the EGW committee. Oh, nearest mic. Oh. Yeah, I'll go ahead and click for you. <laughs> what? Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, yes, yeah, of course. Thanks. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Jonas Bohac. I'm a media artist and creative technologist from Vienna, Austria. Um, I'm here to present uh, the project called Vinyl OS. It's a joint project collaboration I did together with uh, Josef Hu who is probably currently wrapping it up at the Alt Control GDC booth. Um, let me just check my notes. Yeah, it's a project we developed over the last year in our free time. And we're calling it an alternative controller device art um, turntable console. Um, if you wonder what device art it, you might want to check it out. Uh, you might like it. It's pretty cool Japanese media art thingy. Um, but we're here to talk about Vinyl OS. Vinyl OS is, um, enables you to play games, video games, on uh, turntables. And this works by, firstly, we're projecting onto the uh, onto the, onto a white uh, record. So we're using the record as a screen. Um, and secondly, there is an audio track, a time code, audio signal actually on the, on the record. And as you toy with the record, as you play it back, as you spin it or scratch it, this audio gets played back and it gets played into the computer. And the computer listens to the signal and therefore it can tell um, the speed the record is turning and the direction. It's a system actually used for digital DJs to control MP3s for DJs who use digital systems, whatever. Um, so, um, yeah, that's the two kind of things needed to make this work. Can we have the videos play, actually? Yeah, we're trying to do that. Seems to be a technical difficulty. Yeah. <laughs> um, like? so, we, so far, we developed two games for this um, setup. Uh, one is a circular shooter, so you, so you uh, turn the record and you scratch uh, the record, like you scratch, you make a scratch move like a DJ and you scratch to shoot your uh, enemies. And the second one is a kind of uh, defend your base like uh, game where you swing a pendulum and have to kick out objects off the, off the record, virtual objects off the record. Um, to to the wife, kind of. Who has who has actually seen it? Who has played it? Who knows what I'm talking about? Okay, cool. Wow, that many people. Great. Yeah. Um, I can't show you anything anymore. I guess. <laughs> okay. So thank you. Cool. Alrighty. Hi everybody. I'm Taylor. Um, I'm up from uh, DigiPen Institute of Technology, which is up in Washington State, up in the Redmond area. Um, part of Team Silite, uh, the 16 plus team that has uh, bought, uh, built this uh, project, Sand Garden. Um, up there is a, a picture of most of the team, uh, just to give you an idea of the kind of scale of everyone involved with this project, and also uh, the initial prototype of our uh, sandbox. Uh, so to give you an idea of what the game actually is, uh, Sand Garden is a game where the idea was to make a game entirely out of a box of sand. So the only controller is that box of sand. And more than that, we just we wanted it to be an actual game with objectives. Uh, so how the game works is we take a connect that's mounted above the box of sand. Uh, we take the height map from that. We crop it and put it, do, do a little bit of post-processing. And then we plug that directly into uh, Unity's terrain component. Um, from there, the actual gameplay 
is we spawn a bunch of houses on the map, and then each one wants to be at a specific height. Uh, some of the more interesting things uh, about the actual design of the game were that trying to break down the space of a sandbox into just simple actions. So we tried to center the entire game around building hills and making holes in the sand. Uh, that way, we could communicate to the player uh, how to interact with our controller in the most easy way. And from there, we built uh, our entire game. Thank you very much for your time. Hello, my name is Anders Karlsson, and I live on an island in Sweden where I study game design. Every year there is a project called Theme Park there where the first year will make a game with an unconventional controller. It could be controlled by anything from a pair of backpacks to a bookshelf. So I got together with my amazing team and we made a a game that we like to call Zombie Crawler. And there's supposed to be a video showcasing it. Do I need to? Okay. Yeah. That's, that's or... Oh, our video plays. <laughs> <laughs> I'm disappointed. Are you satisfied with your performance? You just have to try a little bit more. Oh. You just ruined my day. I hope you feel good about yourself. Hi. I'm Yumeng, an undergrad from Design Technology Program at Parsons School of Design. My teammates, Jane, Charles, Chuck, Max, Magnus, and I created Victor the Loser. And seemingly an old school intelligence test machine, Victor reveals its true colors when it feels threatened by the player's imminent victory and tries to sabotage the player's progress and mock their destined failure. So we don't have that much experience making games, and we just came together to this course called the New Arcade at our school. And we started out thinking about different kinds of people that who play games. And one of the things we landed on was this idea of a bad loser. Someone who really wants to play with you, but start to get a little upset when they start to lose. And sometimes you just have to let them win a little bit in order to prevent the drama. So what are you really trying to accomplish while playing with Victor? Our game attempts to redefine what it means to win, and especially because Victor only cheats when you're winning. It puts an emphasis on being just okay, being okay at playing a game, and Victor provides an alternative experience focused on the journey rather than the results, a journey that is unexpected and kind of becomes a negotiation. And actually, this game also combined two of my biggest fears. One is the um, intelligence tests that I had to do a lot, of, a lot of them when I was uh, younger. And the other one is that I, um, I'm really bad at playing games in front of other people. So this game gave me, making this game gave me the message that being, feeling bad about yourself actually is OK, and it can be fun. <laughs> and in the end, we would like to thank our teachers, Brian and Henry. And if you haven't played with Victor yet, stop by the all control section um, in the afternoon and see how Victor can ruin the rest of your day. Um, hi, my name is Martin Sebastian Guain. I come from Argentina. I'm really glad being here. Uh, well, they asked me to do this presentation like a couple of days before GDC, so you'll have to excuse my artwork. Um, so let me introduce to you the making of Doggy Tug of War. It's a game about uh, pulling string and playing against a dog. Some of you might have uh, played it. So yeah, well, I I'll tell you the story, right? Because uh, I'll skip the video. Um, well, I was walking down the street, right? That's me on the left. 
uh, and I found a, a printer on the sidewalk, right? So I took it. Uh, it was like in this state, sort of. Uh, yeah. So I, I remember I had this idea, like for an art game. Like it's, uh, imagine this, it's a boat with a crystal glass on it and it's a rope to the dock. So if you pull, it's a metaphor for human relationships, right? So if you pull too hard, the glass will fall and break. But if you like just leave it, it would drift away. Uh, that was the original concept, right? So I started messing up, messing around with the, with all the, the printer and well, with Arduino and all that. And well, finally I said, Instead of just seeing numbers on the screen, why don't put a video and synchronize with it? And I looked at Jiffy.com to find a, a video and took it. And for all the rest of the programming parts, I mean, it's magic. I ain't gonna explain it. it just happens. Yeah. Yeah. And finally, the, the result was this game. Um, you know, you pull against the duck. And well, I'll skip the videos, so thank you for listening, and thanks a lot to John Paulson for organizing this and for emails, for answering all my emails, and Adrian Nobel for standing in the booth with me. Thanks. We're gonna try to run uh, the zombie crawler video real quick. Um, sorry, mind the rewind. Do, except I don't know what this big black bar is doing here. So let's just cut that out. So basically, the, the game is um, two wooden frames on top of each other that, um, with a sort of treadmill on. So it's made to simulate you uh, crawling through a corridor as a zombie. Um, <laughs> go, go ahead. It's a roll of carpet on a frame, and it rotates, and there are handholds in the carpet. You drag yourself. You're playing the zombie. It's only from the waist up. Along the like uh, this, yeah? Yes, and in the way there is furniture uh, in your way that you have to smash with the two buttons that is on the side of, sides of the controller. Right, yes, it's like bam, and you smash the furniture. <laughs> bam. And uh, the goal of the game is to get to the end, so, well, so you can. A scared kid with a shotgun. Yes, that will shoot at you, and you will have to. And you will have to tilt the entire controller from, uh, from right to left to avoid the, the incoming barrage of bullets. Like this, it tilts along this axis. And so I tilt to avoid the shot. So, the so, so the goal will be to get up to this person and uh, then just go nuts and just claw their eyes out. <laughs> <laughs> right. And that's basically the that's game. Basically. Yay! Thank you. Wow, that was intense. Someone just clawed my eyes out in front of the entire EGW folks. Well, okay, so thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Can I get the front mic? Um, yeah, that was, that was intense. <laughs> so there's always one, one presentation every year that doesn't quite work out. But it isn't because we don't love games and it isn't because we didn't try. It's just because sometimes things don't work out the way you expect them to. Um, so let's have a loud round of applause for everyone who presented and let's have all the presenters come up on stage. and all the staff that helped out. If you are a judge and you're in the room, please come up on stage. If you helped set up, please come up on stage. If you helped act out a game, <laughs> uh, please come up on stage. If you donated food, please come up on stage. If you loved Roger Hanna, please come up on stage. I'm not lying, seriously. If you're a friend or a close loved one, someone who worked with him, anyone who had a chance to work with Roger, please come up on stage. Indie Games is, is a community. We're strong because we love each other. Our heart is so huge for all of you. It's like gigantic. 
There are games up here. Please come up and play the games. Please come and tell us that you love us, and please come give me a hug. I love you. We'll see you next year.